We're going to start with uh, Assistant Secretary Rose. Well, Tom, thanks very much for that kind introduction. And it's actually good to be back here in Washington. Uh, by the way of introduction, my name is Frank Rose. I'm the Assistant Secretary of State for Arms Control, Verification, and Compliance. And my work at the State Department is focused on enhancing strategic stability around the world. Arms control, verification, compliance are some of the tools that we use to enhance strategic stability and reassure our allies and partners that we will meet our security commitments. Missile defense is another tool to do just that. At the State Department, I am responsible for overseeing a wide range of defense issues, including missile defense cooperation with our allies and partners around the world. In this capacity, I served as the lead U.S. negotiator for the missile defense basing agreements in Romania, Turkey, and Poland. So I'm pleased to be here today to discuss our efforts at enhancing missile defense cooperation with our allies and partners, one of the key goals from the 2010 Ballistic Missile Defense Review, or BMDR. Now, you have already heard from Elaine Bunn and General Todorov about our missile defense policy and operations. So instead, let me focus my remarks on three areas. Uh, one, the significant progress we have made in implementing the Euro European phase adaptive approach and NATO missile defense. Two, cooperation on missile defense with allies outside of Europe. And three, I'll conclude with a few points on Russia and missile defense. Before I do that, I do want to reiterate one point that you undoubtedly heard from Elaine and Ken. The President's fiscal year 2016 budget protects and enhances our important missile defense priorities such as the European phase adaptive approach and reflects the high priority we place on these efforts. As such, the U.S. commitment to NATO missile defense in the sites in Romania and Poland remains, as former Secretary of Defense Chuck Hagel said, quote, ironclad. With that, let me take a few moments to discuss where we are with regards to overall implementation of the President's European Phase Adaptive Approach, or EPAA, and the United States's, the United States's national contribution to the North Atlantic Treaties Organization's missile defense system. In 2009, pres the President announced that the EPAA would, quote, provide stronger, smarter, and swifter defenses of American forces in America's allies, while relying on, quote, capabilities that are proven and cost effective. Since then, we have been working hard to implement his vision and have made great strides in recent years. I just returned from Turkey and Romania last week and had the opportunity to, to discuss our progress with these two key partners. Turkey was the first country to receive EPA elements in phase one with the deployment of an ANTPY2 radar to that country in 2011. At the same time, we began the start of a sustained deployment of Aegis Ballistic Missile Defense, or Aegis BMD, capable uh, ships in the Mediterranean. With the declaration of interim ballistic missile defense or BMD capability at the NATO Chicago summit in May 2012, the radar in Turkey was transitioned to NATO operational control. Additionally, Spain agreed in 2011 to host four Aegis BMD capable ships at the existing uh, naval facility at Rota as a Spanish contribution to NATO missile defense. In February of last year, the first of four missile defense capable ships, USS Donald Cook, arrived in Rota, Spain. A second ship, the USS Ross, joined her last June. During 2015, two more of these multi mission ships, USS Porter and USS Kearney, will forward deploy to Rota. These multi mission ships will conduct maritime security operations humanitarian missions, training exercises, and support U.S. and NATO operations, including missile defense. Currently, we are focused on completing the deployment of an Aegis Ashore site in Romania as part of Phase 2 of the EPAA. Romania's strong support for the timely completion of the arrangements 
needed to implement this deployment and Romania's provision of security and its infrastructure efforts have been superb. <clears throat> In October 2014, the U.S. Navy held a historic Naval Support Facility Establishment Ceremony at the Missile Defense Fil Facility at Devasulu Air Base in Romania. This ceremony established the Naval Facility and installed its first U.S. commander. Currently, this site is on schedule to be completed by the end of this year, and when operational, the site combined with BMD-capable ships in the Mediterranean, will enhance coverage of NATO from short and medium-range ballistic missiles from the Middle East. And finally, there is phase three. This phase includes an Aegis Ashore site in Poland equipped with a new SM-3 Block 2A interceptor. The site is on schedule for deployment in the 2018 timeframe. For example, this, the President's FY16 budget includes approximately $200 million for the establishment of site, this site. The interceptor site in Poland is key to the EPAA. When combined with other EPAA assets, Phase 2 of Phase 3 will provide the necessary capabilities to provide ballistic missile defense coverage of all NATO European territory in the 2018 timeframe. So, as you can see, we are continuing to implement the President's vision for stronger, smarter, and swifter missile defenses in Europe. I would also like to highlight the efforts that our NATO ally, of our NATO allies to develop and deploy their own national contributions for missile defense. A great example is that today, Patriot batteries from three NATO countries are deployed in Turkey under NATO command and control to augment Turkey's air defense capabilities in response to the crisis on Turkey's southeastern border. Voluntary national contributions are the foundation of the NATO missile defense system, and there are several approaches allies can take to make important and valuable contributions in this area. First, Allies can acquire fully capable BMD systems possessing sensor, shooter, and command and control capabilities. Second, allies can acquire new sensors or upgrade existing ones to provide a key ballistic missile defense capability. Finally, allies can contribute to NATO's ballistic missile defense capability by providing essential basing support, such as Turkey, Romania, Poland, and Spain have already agreed to do. In all of these approaches, however, the most critical requirement is NATO interoperability. Yes, acquiring a ballistic missile defense capability is, of course, good in and of itself. But if that capability is not interoperable with the alliance, then its value as a contribution to alliance deterrence and defense is significantly diminished. It is only through interoperability that the Alliance can gain the optimum effects from BMD cooperation and enhance NATO BMD through shared battle space awareness and reduce interceptor wastage. <coughs> Let me now turn to some of the other regions of the world. The United States, in cooperation with our allies and partners, is continuing to bolster missile defenses in other key regions, such as the Middle East and the Asia Pacific, in order to strengthen regional deterrence architectures. In the Middle East, we are already cooperating with our key partners bilaterally and multilaterally through such fora as the recently established U.S. Gulf Cooperation Council, or GCC, Strategic Cooperation Forum. Uh, at the September 26, 2013 Strategic Cooperation Forum, Secretary Kerry and his foreign ministry counterparts reaffirmed their intent, first stated at the September 28, 2012 Strategic Cooperation Forum, to, quote, work towards enhance U.S. GCC coordination on ballistic missile defense. Several of our partners in the region have expressed an interest in buying missile defense systems, and some have already done so. For example, the United Arab Emirates, or UAE, has contracted to buy two terminal high-altitude area defense, or THAAD, batteries when operational will enhance the UAE's national security 
as well as regional stability. The UAE has also taken delivery of its Patriot Pac-3 batteries, which provide a lower tier point defense of critical national assets. We look forward to advancing cooperation and interoperability with our GCC partners in the coming months and years ahead. Additionally and separately, the United States maintains a strong defense relationship with Israel, and our cooperation on missile defense has resulted in a comprehensive missile defense architecture for Israel. Israeli programs such as Iron Dome, the David Sling weapon system, and the Arrow weapon system, in conjunction with operational cooperation with the United States, create a multi-layered architecture designed to protect the Israeli people from varying types of missile threats. Turning to the Asia-Pacific region, we are continuing to cooperate through our bilateral alliances and key partnerships. For example, the United States and Japan are working closely together to develop the SM-3 Block 2A interceptor, which will make a key contribution to uh, our European phase adaptive uh, approach, as well as being deployed in other regions of the world. We, are also, we also recently completed the deployment of a second ANTP-Y2 radar in, to Japan, which will enhance the defense of both the United States and Japan. And finally, we are continuing to work on enhancing interoperability between U.S. and Japanese forces, which will be aided by recent changes to the U.S.-Japan Defense Cooperation Guidelines, which we expect to be completed soon. We also continue to consult closely with our allies in Australia. For example, as a result of U.S.-Australia foreign and defense ministerial level consultations over the past year, the United States and Australia have established a bilateral missile defense working group to examine options for potential Australian contributions to ballistic missile defense. Additionally, we are also consulting closely with the Republic of Korea as it develops the Korean Air and Missile Defense System, which is designed to defend the Republic of Korea against air and missile threats from North Korea. The Republic of Korea recently announced it plans to purchase Patriot Pac-3 missiles, which will enhance its capability to defend against the North Korean ballistic missile threat. Finally, let me say a few things about missile defense and Russia. Prior to the suspension of our dialogue on missile defense as a result of Russia's illegal actions in Ukraine, Russia continued to demand that the United States provide it, quote, legally binding guarantees that our missile defenses will not harm or diminish its strategic nuclear deterrent. These guarantees would have been based on a criteria that would have limited our missile defenses and undermined our ability to stay ahead of the ballistic missile threat. The Ballistic Missile Defense Review is quite clear on our policy. U.S. missile defense is not designed nor directed against Russia and China's strategic nuclear forces. However, at the same time, we have also made it clear that we cannot and will not accept legally binding or other constraints that limit our ability to defend ourselves, our allies, and our partners. The security of the United States, its allies and partners, is our first and foremost solemn responsibility. As, the, as such, the United States will continue to insist on having the flexibility to respond to evolving ballistic missile threats, free from obligations or constraints that limit our BMD capabilities. Let me conclude by saying that we have made a great deal of progress on missile defense cooperation with our allies and partners around the world over the past several years. This was a key goal of the 2010 Ballistic Missile Defense Review. In Europe, implementation of the EPAA in NATO missile defense is going well. For example, <clears throat> the missile defense radar in Turkey has been operating since 2011, and the Aegis Ashore site in Romania is scheduled to become operational later this year. In the Middle East, we are continuing to work bilaterally and multilaterally with our partners in the GCC to deploy effective missile defenses. For example, later this year, the United Arab Emirates will take delivery of its first THAAD battery. Furthermore, we continue to work with Israel to expand its multi-layered architecture to protect it from missile threats. In the Asia-Pacific, 
We are working actively with our allies to enhance our missile defense capabilities in the region. On that note, we recently completed deployment of a second missile defense radar in Japan, which will enhance both the defense of the United States and Japan. Finally, we continue to oppose Russia's attempts to impose limitations on our missile defenses that would limit our ability to defend ourselves, our allies, and our partners. Suffice to say, defense of our allies and partners through assistance on missile defense cooperation is and will remain a key priority for the U.S. Government. Thank you very much, and I look forward to your questions. Great. Well, if, uh, first of all, let me um, thank uh, CSS for being on this uh, panel today. It's a pleasure and honor for me to follow in Frank's footsteps here. And uh, he talked a lot about cooperation in the missile defense area between the United States, Europe, and Asia. And I'll talk a little bit about potential cooperation that might have worked out, but so far has not. And I'll pick up then on his last remarks about the United States, NATO, and Russia. If you look back over the last 10 years, missile defense has been one of the truly contentious issues on the U.S.-Russia relationship. And there have been a, attempts to explore the possibility to resolve the issue, to look at the possibility for cooperation either between the United States and Russia or, or NATO and Russia, thus far without success. So if you go back to 2007, a conversation even between President Bush and President Putin about could there be a cooperative effort between Washington and Moscow, when the George W. Bush administration plan was to deploy 10 ground-based interceptors in Poland, variants of the missiles that are now deployed in Alaska, accompanied by a supporting radar in the Czech Republic. Uh, the Russians were opposed to this plan, and, and what you had was an offer from the Russian side to make available to the United States radar data from the Russian radar at Garbal, actually now in, in Azerbaijan, and I think has been since closed down, and also a radar that was in under construction at Armavir, both of these radars having very good views of Iran. But the problem, the nub of the issue was the U.S. government was interested in that idea in addition to American plans. Uh, the Russian proposal was providing the radar data in place of the plans to deploy missile defenses in Europe. Uh, so that never really got started. Uh, the second attempt came up at the end of 2010 uh, at a NATO-Russia summit in Lisbon, uh, where the uh, summit concluded with a meeting between the leaders of NATO and then Russian President Dmitry Medvedev, where they agreed to explore the possibility for NATO-Russia cooperation on a missile defense arrangement to defend Europe. And in early 2011, you actually had quite active dialogue, including between the Pentagon and the Ministry of Defense, but also dialogues in track two. Uh, the Euro Atlantic Security Initiative had a dialogue going on. At Brookings, we were running a conversation led by former Secretary Albright and former Foreign Minister uh, Ivanov. The Peer Center in Moscow was talking about this. And a lot of these ideas seemed to complement each other. And by, I'd say, the spring of 2011, there was actually a fairly rich menu of ideas out there as to what a NATO-Russia cooperative arrangement on missile defense would look like. And it included four or five central elements, which it seemed that most of these dialogues were talking about in one form or another. One was the importance of transparency, uh, and that proceeds from the logical point that each side had to understand the capabilities and the plans of the other if you were, in fact, going to have a cooperative missile defense system. Second, the advantage of joint exercises, an area where there was actually U.S.-Russian experience going back to the late 1990s, and even some NATO-Russian experience, joint exercises as a way to develop that cooperation. Third, uh, sort of a sense on both sides that you couldn't have a single combined system because Russia was not prepared to work for a NATO commander, and NATO was not prepared to work for a Russian commander. So the idea seemed to evolve around two independent systems that would interact at key points. But with NATO retaining the control over a decision to launch a NATO interceptor, and Russia retaining control over a Russian decision to launch a Russian interceptor. But they would interact through jointly manned centers, manned by NATO and Russian military personnel. One was a data fusion center, which would take data information from satellites, radars on the NATO side, take information from the Russian side, bring it to a single point, combine it to generate a common operational picture. And then that picture would then be shared with both the NATO and the Russian missile defense headquarters and give them, presumably, a, a better sense of what was happening in the missile defense ar environment around Europe. Uh, a second uh, center, also jointly manned, would be a planning and operations center, where NATO and Russian officers would talk about things like threat scenarios, 
what sorts of attack scenarios that they worried about, and what would there be their rules of engagement. You know, in the extreme, you wanted to have a situation where if there was a ballistic missile attack coming towards Europe and both uh, NATO and Russia chose to engage that target, you wanted to know enough about what the other guy was going to do so that your interceptors engaged the ballistic missile target and not each other. But the official dialogue in 2011 bogged down. And then you had, as Frank mentioned, this Russian insistence on a legal guarantee that American missile defenses not be oriented against Russian strategic ballistic missiles. And that demand was accompanied by what the Russians called objective criteria, which when you asked for explanations, it meant limits on the numbers, velocity, and locations of missile interceptors, uh, in effect, a resurrection of the anti-ballistic missile treaty. I'll make a couple of comments on this. First, I think in 2010, 2011, I actually, it might not have been hard to work out an arrangement of 10 years duration, 10 years duration, that would do two things. That would limit missile defenses in a way that would address stated Russian concerns, uh, even if we did not think there was much basis to those concerns, but would still allow the U.S. over the succeeding 10 years to do everything it wanted to do in terms of addressing a rogue ballistic missile threat posed by North Korea or Iran. Uh, but I think that agreement, which might have been possible, you know, was simply not doable here in the United States for political reasons. The second observation I would make is that looking towards the future, if at some point we reach a point where there's some greater degree of equivalence between missile defense capabilities and strategic offensive forces, we may feel we'll face a decision where we have to look at a missile defense treaty in parallel with a treaty that reduces and limits strategic offensive arms. But the point I would make is that that area of, or that time of equivalence is not now. We are far from it. Uh, in fact, there's a huge gap now between offense and defense. In February of 2018, when the New START limits take full effect, Russia will have on order of about 1,500 deployed ballistic missile warheads on its intercontinental ballistic missiles and its submarine-launched ballistic missiles, and a rate against that will be at most 44 American interceptors with the capability, with the velocity, to attack strategic ballistic missile targets. So I'd argue at this point in time, a missile defense treaty is not necessary. Uh, there was an offer in 2013 from the United States government as a replacement to look at an executive agreement that would provide transparency on the two sides missile defense forces on current programs, but also looking at 10 years. And the essential philosophy behind that was to give each side so much information that the Russian military could look out and say, well, here's where the Americans are going to be on missile defense in 2021. Here's where we will be. Is that a threat? You know, my own view is that they would conclude that should, looking at that objectively, they would conclude it's not a threat. But if a threat were to emerge, they would have ample time to react in advance. But at this point, there's been no sign of Russian interest in that idea. So the question is, where do you go next? Uh, it seems to me that uh, arms control, particularly regarding further nuclear reductions and missile defense, was fairly stuck already in 2013. And since then, you've had the crisis over Ukraine, the broader deterioration in relations between the West and Russia, and that's only going to make the atmospherics more difficult. The question is, at what point would the Russians be interested in a more serious dialogue on arms control? And there may be some possibilities there if uh, the financial burdens, the financial difficulties in Russians continue. And at some point, perhaps, as you get closer to 2021, which is when the, uh, the uh, New START Treaty would lapse on its own terms, perhaps the Russians will then wish to explore a successor to New START. Uh, and then the question is, if you get to that point, Will the Russians be prepared for a more serious discussion, a more successful discussion on missile defense that perhaps could get back to an idea of NATO-Russia missile defense cooperation? Uh, much is going to depend, first of all, on the Russian attitudes. And at this point, uh, it's probably not easy to be optimistic. I, I, I try to understand where Russia is going on missile defense. And it seems to me that there are maybe two or three reasons that explain uh, their reluctance to engage in a more cooperative approach. Uh, quite apart from the general deterioration in political relations. One is, I, I think the Russians have a certain fear about American missile defense capabilities and the potential. Uh, even if they understand some of the limits of current American missile defense programs, the Russians uh, give great credit to American technical proudness and our, and our ability to do things. Uh, when I was assigned to American Embassy Moscow in 1986 uh, and had the arms control portfolio in the embassy, I think it's fair to say the Soviets at that point were still somewhat panicked that the strategic defense initiative was going to put them out of the ballistic missile business. And there is still a, that lingers that the Americans can do a lot uh, if they put their minds to it. I think a second point uh, is also 
that there are bureaucratic reasons in Russia that argue against cooperation. I think there are some in the Ministry of Defense who don't want to cooperate because they can hold up an opposing American missile defense program as a vehicle to secure more resources for the Russian S-300, S-400, and S-500 programs. And then finally, an additional impediment to talking to the Russians about cooperation in Europe is that at one level, that's going to mean the, European, uh, the Russians having to accept uh, that there will be American military infrastructure in Romania and Poland. And that's something that, in general, they've opposed since NATO enlargement began 20 years ago. Uh, but also, the ability to reach some kind of a get back to a more cooperative discussion with Russia is going to depend on how far and how fast the U.S. proceeds on missile defense. Uh, I would argue that missile defense against a limited ICBM attack against the United States, such as might be mounted in the future by a North Korea or Iran, is a sensible part of an overall American force mix. But it seems to me that when you look at a, dealing with a larger scale attack, such as might be mounted by either Russia or China, offense still has the advantage over defense. And as one example, I would note that the plan to deploy 14 additional interceptors in Alaska is going to cost roughly $1 billion. Uh, my guess is either Russia or China could add 14 additional offensive ballistic uh, missile warheads for significantly less. But at least until at some point there may be a technological breakthrough that changes that equation, but it's not immediately evident now. And therefore, it seems to me that if you want to get back to something like a more cooperative discussion with the Russians on this, which is going to require moving past the very difficult point we find in the broader relationship, reassuring the Russians that our intention is not aimed at blunting a Russian missile attack is going to be key to a more productive discussion. Thanks very much. So we'll, uh, we'll keep the, the conversation going. I, I think I'll kick it off uh, actually with a comment uh, about an article that you wrote this past, uh, I think it was maybe 10, 10 days ago or so, on uh, the limits of missile defense. It was kind of the anniversary of the like, 32nd anniversary of SDI. And you gave a history of, in a way, how, uh, how the expectations are relatively modest for, for missile defense in the big scheme of things, the offense-defense trade-off and that sort of thing. It reminded me of a comment by Condi Rice uh, during the Bush administration where she said, you know, what we're pursuing is not, the, it's not Star Wars, it's not the son of Star Wars, it's not even the grandson of Star Wars. Uh, it's so different. Mm -hmm. and, and so in a way, I'm, I'm struck by, you know, why, why is it that the Russia thing keeps recurring? Why do we need to worry about um, reassuring Russia when it is so limited, after all? So let me, let me throw that to you first, first yeah. of all. And, and should we be, should we, in a way, should we be even having that conversation? Yeah. Well, I, I guess I would say, I mean, you, you don't want to reassure Russia for, I mean, the reason would be to try to reassure Russia is to enable you to achieve other things. If you could find a way to diffuse missile defense as a problem, does that make it easier for Russia to address issues such as further nuclear reductions? Um, you've had over the last uh, three years, I think, the Russians, uh, in my view, have, for whatever reasons, concluded they don't want to proceed beyond the New START Treaty at this point in time in terms of nuclear reductions. So they've linked missile defense, they've linked prompt global strike, they've linked third country nuclear forces, Frank, there's three or four others probably, but they have these linkages, and they haven't moved to solve any one of those problems. So it seems to be aimed at providing a pretext for why they shouldn't uh, do more on nuclear reductions. And so you know, if you could get this to a more serious discussion, could you find a way to remove missile defense as a problem? I mean, I think that would be one reason for assurance. And again, there might be advantages if you could get back to a, a cooperative NATO Russia. I mean, you could take an issue which has been contentious and as difficult as it would appear now, perhaps make it a cooperative element in a West-Russia relationship. Yeah. yeah, I don't have anything uh, too much to add to what Steve uh, had to say. I think he's essentially right. Uh, but let me go back to a point that Steve mentioned in his uh, remarks about Russian concerns. Uh, I would say that the Russians aren't especially concerned about the current level of U.S. missile defense capabilities. They know that 44 long-range interceptors are not going to negate their strategic deterrent. What they are really concerned about is what comes next and the fact that there are no legally binding limitations on numbers and, more importantly, the potential for U.S. technology to leap ahead. 
I remember um, an interaction I had with a very senior Russian general. Uh, and he was giving a briefing showing U.S. Aegis ships in the Baltic shooting down Russian strategic missiles. And I looked at him and I said, General, that's a very interesting slide. Can I ask you a question? And the question is this. How fast are you attributing that sea-based missile defense interceptor? And he looked at me in all seriousness and he said, well, I believe it has a velocity burnout of 10 kilometers per second. Now, there has never been a missile defense or any rocket that has a velocity burnout of 10 kilometers per second. And I said, well, General, if you can find me a sea-based missile defense interceptor that has a velocity burnout of 10 kilometers per second, please let me know, because I want to buy stock in that company. <laughs> and his response was very telling. He goes, you may not be there today, but you'll eventually get there. And that's really <clears throat> the driver of their concern. Because quite frankly, the Russians are much more dependent on nuclear weapons in their strategy and doctrine than we are in the United States. If you look at uh, the history of US nuclear policy and doctrine over the last 25 years through Democrat and Republican presidents, the objective has been to reduce the role of nuclear weapons in our strategy. It's been the exact opposite with regards to Russia. Uh, and from the Russian point of view, missile defenses and the potential for even more advanced missile defenses call into question, not just from a technical perspective, but a political perspective, the viability of their deterrent. And that's fundamentally what the Russian concern is. I wonder if you might speak a little bit more to, uh, in a way, what, okay, put aside for a moment, where the technology might leapfrog yep. to 10 years from now in that kind of world. Uh, but what more ought we be doing in Europe, in the Middle East, and Asia? You, you alluded to some of that, but in a way, the activities. Um, how much more can we work with allies uh, in a way to alleviate our, yeah. our own burdens? We're putting a good part of our <clears throat> budget towards regional missile defenses, yeah. potentially one might say at the expense of homeland. Yeah. What, what can we do to, to boost up our allies uh, further? Well, I would say there are a couple of things. Um, First and foremost, interoperability. I talked about this in my opening statement. Uh, it's one thing to have a missile defense system. It's another to ensure that we can share information amongst our systems and with our allies. So I think that has got to be a number one priority. And we're actually making a good deal of progress in that area. Uh, second, we can encourage our allies to develop their own and purchase capabilities. I understand that uh, we are in tight budgetary times, but I think there are useful things that we can do with our allies to leverage existing capabilities. For example, the Netherlands has with, on their uh, air defense frigate uh, radar called the Smart L, uh, and they have announced a decision to um, invest several hundred million euros to upgrade that radar. So fundamentally, the more information we can share uh, and take advantage of existing capabilities, uh, I think that is really where the focus needs to be. All right, any comments on that? Why don't we open it up to, uh, to the floor and um, please state your affiliation and uh, ask in the interrogative sense. Well, I'm a uh, retired DOD, former Missile Defense Agency uh, employee, but I have been working the last few years exploring this concept of interoperability. And you know, even in the DOD, interoperability is defined as more than just exchange or sharing of information. It's the ability to use that information for operational effectiveness. So since you mentioned it a number of times, and You've alluded to it when you talk about things we've tried to do, and even in missile defense, we've done a little bit in the sea, in the command and control area with, with Russia, as you know. Where is the champion or the center of gravity or the interagency effort that's looking at interoperability from the point of view of, say, policy, of processes, as well as the IT where you exchange and share information? 
And I might add FMS to that as well. Yeah. Um, you know, fundamentally, I think it's a partnership between DOD and state. Uh, I think there is a uh, general recognition across most senior level folks who work these issues, both in DOD and state, that this is where we need to do a better job. And I think we have made some progress over the past couple of years. Uh, that said, is there a lot more work to do to make us effective in this area? Absolutely. But are we doing things to ensure that we can share more information, uh, number one, and two, effectively use that information? I think the answer is yes. Uh, I talked in my remarks about the U.S.-Japan US Defense Cooperation Guidelines. Uh, we hope to finalize that soon. Uh, and you know, one of the key elements in there, we hope, is increased ways that we can work together uh, effectively in the area of missile defense. Uh, over here in the back. I'll, uh, I'll get loud. Oh, it's coming. Just, just wait one second. James Kiesling, uh, U.S. Uh, ATNL and uh, CAPE. Uh, I have a fundamental question. Is uh, either the ambassadors uh, aware that the uh, Putin 2007 offer was actually a re-up of a U.S. offer uh, put together by uh, Dr. Bill Frederick working for uh, BMDO in 1997 and provided over to the uh, Russians in 1998? Specifically, uh, one major motivation on the part of the Russians may be that they felt that we disowned our own offer. Well, you know, I have worked missile defense cooperation between the U.S. and Russia in the Clinton, Bush, and Obama administrations. And, and quite frankly, uh, despite uh, a lot of politics, there's a certain amount of continuity in U.S. <laughs> offers to the Russians. Uh, I'm not specifically aware of that specific proposal that you mentioned uh, back in 1997. But what I would say is that across the spectrum of administrations on the U.S. side, there have been very similar proposals to work with the Russians on missile defense cooperation. Unfortunately, none have worked um, because we always, at the end, come to the challenge of Russia wants guarantees and limitations on U.S. missile defenses. And I think that makes us, makes cooperation very, very difficult. And, and I think that goes back to the problem that you had in 2007 was the Russia and offer of data from both Garbala and Armager I think was very attractive. You know, but the price of getting access to that Russian radar data would be foregoing the planned deployments of interceptors uh, in, in Poland. And so you have to ask the question, then, well, if you have the data that shows the missiles coming, but you've given up the interceptors, you, you really, I think, have negated the, 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 uh, the plan, which was to provide some missile defense capability. All right, Richard, uh, right in front. And suddenly a microphone appears. Thank you. Um, so I want to bridge between the points you were making um, uh, and ask about the potential effect of having the EPAA deployments um, take place at the end of this year and then again in 2018 timeframe. Uh, and if we, if we remain uh, sort of consistent with our principle of transparency and we say, hey, this is what we told you we're gonna do, this is what we're doing, this is as far as we're going, obviously it's threat dependent. Um, and over time, and I'm discounting the Ukraine uh, mess right now because that's stopping everything from going forward. Do you, Steve, or you, Frank, uh, perceive the possibility that Russia's level of anxiety might diminish as they see that we are, in fact, doing what we said we're going to do and not going to 10,000 interceptors with VBOs of 10, et, et cetera? Um, or do you anticipate that the, the anxiety will not change uh, despite the fact that we have been consistent and been transparent and told them exactly what we're going to do? Um, or, or is that a basis for maybe ratcheting down the, the anxiety and maybe thinking about something? Because this is really designed to avoid instability, miscalculation, uh, drawing responses that we would not think are in our interest, et cetera. 
Well, I think the first question is, do the Russians wish to have their anxieties relieved? And I think th this, is, this is the distinction between the anxieties that they portray and the anxieties that they really feel. A and my guess would be is that you know, the smarter people in the Ministry of Defense who understand this have a you know, fairly good appreciation for what our missile defenses can do and what they can't do, albeit I think you know, Frank's exactly right. There is that fear is, you know, what will the Americans come up with 10, 15 years down the road? But, but, uh, but there's that distinction between their, their real understanding of what we can do and what they have chosen to portray. Now, sometimes I think it's kind of interesting. I think they actually get themselves caught up a little bit where they begin to talk so much about missile defenses. And then you have Deputy Prime Minister Rogozin, I think, comes out periodically and talks about their new ICBM, which is the killer of missile defenses. So they're, they're trying to modulate this message, which is on the one hand, uh, a, a message I think targeted primarily at Europe. You know, the Americans are doing things, they're making us concerned, it's contributing to a bad relationship. And you know, what is it really getting you in terms of missile defense protection? But then they have to go back and reassure their domestic audience that well, the Americans have these missile defenses and we're worried, but no, don't worry too much because we have the ICBMs that can penetrate it. So I, I think the, the, the real question comes down to is, you know, are the Russians prepared to have those concerns allayed? And if they are, you know, my guess is that you know, it would not be hard to come up with ways to do it. Yeah. Uh, the only thing I would add is that in addition to the technical concerns that the Russians have about the future capabilities of U.S. missile defense si systems, they're also concerned about the permanent presence of American military capabilities in Eastern Europe. Uh, and a lot of their concerns are driven by this. Uh, although I, I would act, what they've done over the last year, I think, is pretty much they're taking care of that issue. I, I think the Pentagon term is that we now have, as I understand, four company-sized units in each of the Baltic states or, and Poland. Uh, and the Pentagon explains it as a persistent deployment. Uh, my guess is persistent doesn't have much difference from permanent, and that those deployments are going to be there until you see a fairly major change in Russia. Uh, given uh, the uh, force that Russia has used in Ukraine, some of the rhetoric that's coming out of Moscow now, and, and the fact that you see heightened military activities like Russian bombers flying all around NATO airspace. So let me say two things. One, I think we heard a lot this, uh, earlier this afternoon uh, from uh, both General Todorov uh, and uh, Dazdi Bun that you know, missile defense is becoming less exotic. It's one piece of a much larger uh, portfolio of capabilities, et cetera. It's also becoming very firmly entrenched in how no. we think about our, our national security. It's not going away. Uh, so even though it's not a silver bullet, it's very, it's, it's, it's key and critical. Um, so in a way, notwithstanding the insincerity, you might say, uh, strategic ins insincerity on the Russians on some, uh, some of these things, what if you might speak, especially bo both of you, about in a way the changing perception among everybody else? among our allies, for example, about just the appetite for missile defenses. There seems to be a lot of it. In the Middle East, they're putting real dollars behind it, uh, certainly in Asia. Ha in NATO, it was part of the 2010 strategic concept. That is going to be rewritten sometime in the near future, and it's probably not going to be any less. So where do you see the appetite for all this going? Uh, only up, especially as the threat continues to increase. Um, you know, sometimes here in the United States, we try to separate missile defense from our larger national security strategy. And I think one of the things that the Ballistic Missile Defense Review from 2010 does a really good job at is putting missile defense at the heart of our overarching national security strategies. Um, quite frankly, effective missile defenses are a key enabling technology for our other defense and foreign policy uh, goals, especially as countries try to keep and deploy, deploy capabilities to keep the United States out of regions. It is a key enabler. So I think cooperation is going to continue to expand, and I also think that Again, missile defense is a key element of our overarching national security and defense strategy. Any thoughts on that? All right. Uh, Bruce, uh, the back. Hi. Uh, again, Bruce McDonald, uh, Federation of American Scientists, Peace Institute, Johns Hopkins Sice. Um, Russia has said um, tough, uh, multiple times over the last several years that they're going to develop more missile defense. And that's of interest uh, to 
to us, uh, for the work we're doing on what's looking a little bit more, looking into the future, is more like a multipolar missile defense uh, world, US, China, Russia, uh, India. Of course, they say that they will. Uh, so I get my questions to our, our esteemed uh, guests here. Uh, that what have you heard uh, Russians say about what they plan to do on missile defense? And uh, more importantly, what do you believe? What's bluster? What's beef? What are they up to? Uh, that's a good question. Maybe Steve has some more uh, insights on that. I've been trying to ask yeah. myself this question yeah. for many years. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I think there's a disconnect you see between the way they talk about American missile defense and when you look at Russian missile defense programs. Yeah. The S-300, the S-400, the S-500 are all basically designed to replicate capabilities that we have in PAC-3, uh, PAC THAAD, and the SM-3. Uh, so uh, it, it's, it's not unusual for the Russians to say one thing and do something else, but I think they're looking at these sorts of missile defense capabilities as a logical part of their force mix. In the back. Greg Tillman, Arms Control Association. Uh, Frank, you mentioned the importance of uh, the SM-32A deployments uh, in Poland by 2018, uh, 2018 for providing territorial defense for all of Europe. Uh, there has not been yet uh, an Iranian ICBM flight test. There has not been a North Korean ICBM flight test. Um, that would, by my calculations, mean that this threat is 12 years overdue from the Rumsfeld Commission's uh, prediction. When does the more slowly developing threat start to impact the adaptive part of the European phase adaptive approach? Mm -hmm. uh, well, that's a good question. I would say the SM3 Block 2A, which will be deployed in uh, Poland in the 2018 timeframe, is not designed to deal with ICBM class threats, but medium and intermediate range threats. Um, you may recall back in 2013, the administration dis decided to restructure the SM-3 Block 2B missile for a variety of reasons, technological challenges, um, financial challenges, uh, and a number of other <coughs> problems. But the bottom line is phase Three of the European EPAA is designed to deal with medium and intermediate range threats. And I would note that uh, despite the fact that Iran has not yet developed a uh, ICBM today, uh, they are continuing to develop medium and intermediate range class ballistic missiles and therefore we are working with our friends and partners to deal with that threat. And presumably stay ahead of it. And, pre and presumably stay ahead of it. Gentleman in the front. Thank you. Edward F. Georgetown University. I was the last U.S. Commissioner for the ABM Treaty, so I have mixed memories of all these issues. L let me come back to the, the question of why are the Russians being so obstinate here? The fundamental problem, it seems to me, is that all of the U.S. assurances are in the present tense. We are not. But almost by definition, assurances have to be in the future tense. We will not. And that's what the Russians are asking for. And that's what we've been unable to do. Find a sentence that begins with we will not and, and then finish it in some way that we can live with. Seems to me that really is our fundamental problem. Thank you. But as you noted, it's been the administration's hard policy not to agree to any legally binding restrictions or other exactly limitations. Exactly that way. Yeah. Well, let me say a couple of things. One, uh, we're not just looking at, well, we're not looking at Russia when we're dealing with our missile defenses. We're looking at other capabilities. And quite frankly, sometimes we are surprised. For example, two years ago when we made the decision to deploy the additional 14 GBIs in Alaska, that was driven by the fact that North Korea had paraded a new mobile ICBM. And we had not seen that before. 
Uh, so I would say, number one, we need to have the flexibility to deal with surprises like North Korea's new mobile ICBM. Uh, secondly, the U.S. budget process is fairly transparent. Uh, you can, by reading the Missile Defense Agency's annual press release when the budget comes up, you can determine where and how many missile defense capabilities that we currently have and plan to have. Uh, and I would argue that the U.S. missile defense uh, levels have been very structured to the threat. You're not seeing hundreds of long-range missile defense interceptors. You are seeing 44. So I think, you know, Quite frankly, we're not going to agree to limitations, but if you look at our budget projections as well as our deployments, I think it's very, very consistent with our rhetoric. Yeah, I mean, I think, Ed, I, I understand the dilemma as you describe it, uh, and, but therefore it's a little bit surprising for me that the, that the Russians didn't pick up more on this idea that the administration offered in 2013 of transparency, which actually would have put, a, as I, at least as I understood the proposal, would have laid out, here are the plans looking out 10 years, here are the numbers. So they would have had not limits, but they would have had a very clear picture at a time where I think the numbers of missile defense interceptors would still have been way below anything that would have posed a threat to Russian strategic ballistic missile capabilities. And, and, and so you could have handled that problem that way. Now, later on, if you got into you know, defenses go up and offenses come down, then I think you may have to take a look at the question of legally binding treaty limits if you want to get to further reductions. But the, but the Russians didn't seem to pick up on that idea, at least have not so far. But we're not there yet. Um, I think uh, we're going to cut off there. We're going to go in five minutes for uh, another panel. Our final panel will be uh, Mr. Rich Matlock and uh, also Admiral uh, Archer Macy. And that'll be on future directions, both technological and otherwise. So please, five minutes, and we'll be back uh, for that. Thank you, gentlemen, both of you. Thanks. Appreciate it.